Uh, good morning. I'm Ernie Bauer, the Senior Advisor and Director of the Southeast Asia Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And we are uh, delighted this morning to have uh, uh, the Honorable uh, Tim Grosser, um, the uh, Minister of Trade of New Zealand, who's just arrived in Washington, D.C. Uh, Minister Grosser, welcome to, welcome to Washington. Um, I'd like to first uh, just say uh, our hearts go out to the, to the people in Christ Church. Uh, we're, we're very sorry about the earthquake, and uh, how, are, how are they doing? Well, considering the magnitude of the earthquake, which is the same size as the Haiti earthquake that killed 256,000, while I suppose you wouldn't want to say it to the people of the good folk of Christ Church, they are damn lucky. Not one person killed, other than one person whose heart attack is attributed to the shock. And uh, damage, while extensive to some of the older buildings, um, remarkably little, given the size of the quake. And I think it's intriguing and interesting, perhaps to a broader audience, to just have a two or three words about why. Yeah. Uh, we're called, and this is a deliberate insult by the Australians, of course, uh, our closest friends, uh, the Shaky Isles. Um, I'm sure they have more than just earthquakes in mind. But uh, they call us the Shaky Isles for good reason. We're part of the ring of fire that starts off round about where we think of, Thai, uh, where we think of Japan, through the Indonesian Malay archipelago to New Zealand. And this is a prime earthquake-prone zone where the names of tectonic plates that I've long forgotten collide. So we have to expect earthquakes. And our forefathers showed unbelievable foresight in doing a number of things. Uh, first of all, developing seismic code, building codes, which are requirements for building houses. Almost all the damage was done to houses that were built before the codes were put in place in about 1945-46. Secondly, um, in more sophisticated uh, application of geoengineering, we have put in place geotech solutions to deal with an issue that nobody had heard of except scientists until about six weeks ago called liquefaction, which is one of the main results of earthquakes. And where the geotech solutions have been put in place, the damage has been unbelievably light. Intriguingly, the Chinese are extremely interested in the earthquake, and it is not hard to understand why. They're the place that's building their cities from scratch in, the, in some respects. They're earthquake prone. We had the disaster in Shiswan, what, about a year ago, was it? You know, um, And I think people will look to New Zealand for uh, geotech, seismic solutions, and also some social approaches. Our forebears also put in place what is, I find it hard to believe, but I'm told, the world's largest externally based disaster insurance scheme. So every New Zealander for the last 80 years has had to pay money to a fund that sits offshore to accumulate massive financial resources, relative to the small size of our economy, for disasters like this. So now we're drawing down on their good fortune and on their foresight. So, yeah, a tough story for those who are caught and the children are still very disturbed because the aftershocks go on and on and on and on around the 4.5, 4.6 uh, Richter scale. But uh, you have to step back and think, uh, thank God uh, it was uh, had such little actual consequence considering the massive scale of the quake. Excuse the extended answer, sir. No, no, I uh, appreciate it. Thank you very much. And, and good luck to, the, to those people as they recover. You've been trade minister for about two years now, if I'm right, and I wanted to ask, what um, what's it like being the minister of trade in New Zealand? What are your what are your major challenges? And uh, you know, trade in the United States is extremely political. Um, could you talk a little bit about you know how that works in New Zealand? Well, first of all, uh, Ernie, I um. I come from a rather unusual background for a trade minister. Uh, I actually have been New Zealand's chief trade policy strategist for a number of years. In an, first of all, I was our chief negotiator in the last GATT round, the WTO, now the WTO, the Uruguay round, uh, and secondly, principal economic advisor to our trade ministry. 
uh, uh, so I went into politics as a geriatric, as, you, as it were, uh, with one objective, becoming the trade minister. So I've actually had 30 years, and I was before that I was chairman in Geneva, uh, first of all of the rules group in this negotiation, uh, the group that uh, handles the negotiation on anti-dump subsidies and uh, a few other issues. Uh, and then I became chairman of the agriculture negotiations after the disaster at Cancun in 2003. So I had come with a, um, an unusual background and uh, for me it's just a great privilege to, uh, near the end of my career, uh, to be the minister uh, rather than the senior official. That's on the one hand. The second thing that's rather unusual about New Zealand is that trade is not political in New Zealand. Now this is deeply unusual and wasn't the case 25 years ago. In fact, trade 25 years ago was a deeply divisive political issue. But I think over the years, for a variety of reasons, I wouldn't want to bore you, you with, uh, the two major political parties, one on the centre-left, one on the centre-right, uh, I represent the centre-right uh, party, um, but a, very much a centrist uh, party, not a right-wing party. Uh, we've come to a strong working consensus that uh, we can have our arm wrestle on a whole number of issues in the good democratic sense of that, but this is an issue which doesn't fit into the electoral cycle of any democratic country. I can give you example after example of highly successful trade strategies that we've implemented that have spanned, in some cases, three changes of government. So we have come to a consensus, informally, but a very strong consensus between the two major parties that we have a bipartisan approach to trade issues. And um, I can't say that I can recommend it to anyone else, but it sure has worked for us. Well, thank you very much. Maybe you could come and, and do some seminars uh, in, in Washington. We, we sure need a, a consensus on trade, and that, it, sounds, uh, it sounds very nice. We, we're wrestling with that. Uh, in the sense of uh, the U.S.-New Zealand relationship, trade is obviously, trade and investment is a very important part of that relationship. Um, could you talk about New Zealand's outward perspective on trade, particularly in relation to um, some of the new trade agreements that you've signed with uh, China, uh, India, ASEAN? Um, how, does, uh, how do these agreements uh, fit into your strategy, and and then could you relate those agreements to what you're trying to do with the United States and and TPP? Well, first thing I want to emphasize is we are very close to the United States on a number of issues, and I have worked, uh, I think, extremely well and easily with successive um, USDRs, um, US ambassadors in Geneva, senior USDA people, and the relationship has just been fantastic. Uh, and I think when the New Zealand-US relationship works well, it's a classic example of using the, the huge power and muscle of the United States. But sometimes we can act as what I call a front fence for the United States. If I just uh, just put your question aside for one second and think about another aspect of my responsibilities. I'm also the minister in charge of international climate change negotiations. And one of the initiatives, which is very much a New Zealand fronted, but US being the muscle behind New Zealand, is a research group we put together called the Global Re, uh, Agricultural Research Coalition or Alliance, which springs out of our knowledge that uh, food is a major source of emissions into the upper troposphere. In fact, it's 14%. And people are not going to stop eating, you know, no point in taxing food in the sense that you want to discourage that. Uh, we have got to find technological solutions to the relentless growth of emissions in agriculture because we know as a planet we have to grow about 70% more food by 2050 right. to feed the 3.5 billion extra miles that have to be fed and also accommodate the reality that the development process around the world is working so unbelievably well 
that as hundreds of millions move into the effective middle class, and I use the McKinsey concept of 5,000 US PPP as that base, uh, they're going to want high-quality protein, high-quality foodstuffs that countries like the United States uh, and New Zealand produce. Now, we've got to do that while lowering the growth rate of emissions. So New Zealand's taken some leadership here of fronting up with a whole bunch of scientists from 30 countries, both developed and developing. The United States has essentially uh, put some serious money into this proposal, as well as some of the great brains, scientific brains of this country. And it's a beautiful example, in my opinion, of a very small country, close in values to the United States, working very productively. And I'm going to see uh, Tom Vilsack, the Secretary of Agriculture, later this morning to follow that through. He and I launched this initiative at the Copenhagen meeting. Given the very poor quality result from Copenhagen on climate change, many people told my Prime Minister they thought that what Tom and I had launched was probably the most positive result coming out of the conference. Uh, well, that's maybe exaggerated, but, you know. So, so I just want to give that as an example of, of how the greatest power in the world, the United States, actually sometimes it's great to have little countries like us that share very similar perspectives, working constructively on common international agendas. On the trade agenda, uh, we have been, in my opinion, and I'm going to use big words here, astonishingly successful for a country with so little power and so little influence, and also with such an open market. I mean, sometimes I go around saying, I think I've just sold the Brooklyn Bridge for the seventh time. So we're strongly committed to the multilateral process, and this is not just rhetoric, I promise you. We fully understand that some of the issues of greatest concern to our companies can and will only be resolved by further advancement in the multilateral process. We are never going to see an FTA by whatever name that tackles anti-dumping, that tackles subsidization, that tackles export subsidies, that tackles trade and distorting production link subsidies to um, agriculture, that frankly tackles fishery subsidies adequately, a subject I feel very passionate about. And we've got an initiative, again, very strongly US-New Zealand initiative uh, on fishery subsidies in the WTO uh, to try and arrest this appalling degradation of wild stock uh, fisheries. There are so many issues here that can only be dealt with multilaterally. And people that espouse FTAs with, with while forgetting that have not got the plot. So we're totally committed to that, and, and I've spent 11 years of my professional life in Geneva uh, under various titles doing that gig. But at the same time, we haven't stopped there, and we've pursued a very aggressive FTA strategy that is working unbelievably well, and I'd have to say almost contrary to my own predictions, because I just didn't think we could do it uh, 15, 20 years ago. So I'll just quickly outline where we are and some of the things we're looking at, often jointly with the United States. First, from our point of view, we have established um, a fantastic relationship with Australia. This is our most important partner. It's our closest friend. Um, uh, we're almost, this, almost uh, working towards what I call, uh, to put the Chinese-Taiwan metaphor around the other way around, uh, two countries, one system, whereas China and Taiwan have got this long-term vision of uh, one country, two systems. Well, there's a whole lot of jokes. There's all sorts of inappropriate sheep jokes behind this, but we just get on. Sometimes foreigners don't understand, as we insult each other at dinner parties, that it shouldn't be taken too seriously. So we have this very strong relationship between our two countries. We're brothers in arms historically. We have fought and died together in all the wars together and we're a very strong bond between these two countries. And we've established this comprehensive FTA uh, called the CER, or Closer Economic Relations, exercise in 1982. I was very much part of that uh, negotiating team on the New Zealand side that absolutely did establish the gold standard of the day. So that's in place, that's working well. 24% of our exports go to Australia. They're our largest source of inward FDI and so on and so forth. Then we've established um, a set of relationships in the Asia-Pacific. 
both we and the Australians, um, our economies were strongly geared towards Europe. Uh, primarily, we were offshore farms for uh, for the United Kingdom as, as former colonies of the United Kingdom. Uh, much more strongly so for New Zealand than for Australia. Australia's got other options, massive mineral reserves in the last 20, 30 years, but um, still it couldn't be said about Australia with less force. The movement towards Asia um, has been very difficult uh, in, in, at the beginning from the mid-70s onwards, but is now going unbelievably well. Uh, I don't think we truly saw... Uh, I'd like to pretend we did, but I don't think it would be true, just how much growth and development would take place in the Asia-Pacific when we started down this journey in 1973 when Britain joined the then EEC and our markets disappeared into what was then the protectionist morass of the unreformed common agricultural policy. And let me say for the record, the Europeans, to their great credit, have made huge changes since then, but that's what propelled us down this path. Now, at that stage, it was very much a Japan story, Japan being the first Asian economy to reach developed country status, and uh, the Tigers then, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, and one or two others, they were just at the early phase of their development. Well, to fast forward 30 or 40 years, what an extraordinary Asian success story we, we, we see. And we have established, a, uh, along with Australia, um, a very interesting agreement with a name that would make you blind, uh, ANSFTA. But what it is, is it's a comprehensive FTA starting to come into effect on the 1st of January 2010, so nobody in New Zealand or Australia really is aware of it, but it will influence their futures, which combines the Australian economy, the New Zealand economy, along with the FTA that encompasses the Southeast Asian economies called AFTA. And over the next 10 years, most of it uh, a damn sight sooner than 10 years, this will create a trading block. Out of these two contiguous FTAs, the CER and the AFTA, into one with common rules of area origin, uh, a market of 566 million people, uh, our exports uh, to ASEAN are compounding at around about 11% at the moment, um, going extremely well. Um, we'll probably be selling more to Indonesia in the next uh, five years than we sell to the United Kingdom, which used to take 50% of our exports in 1975. So that's going on. We're also extremely fortunate from an economic perspective in being the only developed country to have a comprehensive FTA with China, um, negotiated by my predecessor in the previous centre-left-led government, uh, now, I mean, uh, going back to my th political point here, how important it has been to have complete continuity of policy for a very small trading economy that doesn't let its domestic arm to wrestle get in the way of structural strategic policy initiatives like this. So they did that, all credit to them, and I'm very careful to give credit to my opponents uh, on trade policy because it's just and deserved. Uh, and we've built um, very successfully on their achievements. Our exports to China are going through the roof. Uh, they've doubled in two years. Um, we've ju China's just overtaken the United States as New Zealand's second largest export market. China is already Australia's largest market. Uh, that's driven very strongly in Australia's case by minerals exports. Uh, the we've I negotiated very recently uh, uh, the first ever FTA that Hong Kong's done with anyone to try and make more coherent the Greater China strategy. That's working extremely well because uh, Hong Kong itself as a separate customs territory of China and a separate member of the WTO is I think the sort of 12th largest trading economy in the world in its own right. So that's going really well and what I was trying to f say to the folk uh, at the services seminar is if you look at the FTAs in the world's most exciting region, the Asia-Pacific region, through the prism of a New Zealand negotiator's eyes, what we see is quite interesting. 
Right throughout the 90s, there's this debate. Um, since I'm talking to a think tank, I'm allowed to talk about intellectual things, all right? Because um, you, you will recall, and, and, and anyone who's interested enough to watch this interview will recall, the great debates between Bagwadi and Bergston over RTAs or regional trade agreements versus the multilateral trade system. You know, my own personal view on that debate 15 years ago was, well, Bagwadi was right, of course. We would have all been far better if we'd never done regional trade agreements and we'd all been faithful and done the right thing by the principle of MFN and multilateralism, blah, 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 blah. But that wasn't the way the world went. So, you know, Bagwadi was right in principle. Burston was right in practice. Um, and these two distinguished gentlemen, I think, at the end of the day, set out the debate in ways that actually both of them have contributed in a very constructive way to understanding what the real issues were, because the real issue was not a choice. So we have tried, and I know the United States has tried as hard as any country, uh, to push forward the, f the horizon on the multilateral front. But as from 1982 onwards, when Bill Brock, then USTR, shifted policy of the United States and said we are this is going too slowly for us. We, when we, the United States, are no longer prepared to find ourselves boxed in. I mean, this is very much frustration about the then unreformed common agricultural policy of the European Union. I'm not a European basher at all. You know, I mean, I've actually uh, a European by birth, um, and I recognise the massive reforms they've they've gone. But actually, was immense frustration with Europe at the time that forced Bill Brock and the U.S. system down this track. Now, in the 90s, during this great debate that so exercised seminars um, of the time, um, and I've written extensively on this myself in sort of quasi-academic terms, the, the quality of some of the FTAs that were being written at the time was very low, actually, and they were often done for political reasons. They were lightweight. More recently, I would argue there's been a flight to quality. And if you look at the FTAs, we concluded they are, I promise you, this is not a politician's rhetoric. Any analyst who looks at them would not be able to come to a different conclusion. They are real high quality. They are comprehensive. There are no exceptions to them in any important sense. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, I'll go into one in depth because it's the most important, the China FTA. So there is effectively no S&D, special differential treatment, other than some very minor extended time frames for their most sensitive products to be completely liberalized. The only exception on goods to complete liberalization are some relatively unimportant tariff lines in the forestry area. And the only reason they're exceptions is because as part of the deal to get China into the WTO, their protocol of accession included a legally binding commitment never to liberalize those tariff lines on forestry other than on a multilateral basis. It was either a U.S. or a Canadian uh, demand when they couldn't get what they wanted. Um, I can't recall which country led that. So apart from that uh, technical exception, which is of no real consequence, we're talking about tariff lines around 7%, you know. Nice to get rid of them, but not the end of the world. We're talking about something without exceptions. Now, if that's not a flight to quality, I don't know what is. The second, and we've just done a deal with Malaysia. That's why we're so keen to see Malaysia come into TPP. Right. Uh, again, exactly. The only exception on the good side is alcohol, and we, they're an Islamic country. Right. Um, in fact, one of the reasons that I am extremely excited about bringing Malaysia into the TPP is precisely because I think trade people like me, um, it might surprise some of the skeptics, we actually do have a broader perspective than just trade. I mean, these are strategic. These are not just trade agreements. These have deep political consequences. And, you know, going back to, I mean, I have not worked my whole life on just trade. I was ambassador to Indonesia at one stage. Uh, the only way we're going to get on top of terrorism from Islamic countries, I'm not pretending terrorism only comes from Islamic countries, is with the help of Islamic countries. I mean, we're never going to do this as non-Islamic peoples on our own. And 
extremely constructive countries like Indonesia and Malaysia, who actually are in the front line of Islamic terrorists. I mean, the number one objective of most Islamic terrorists is, is their own governments, not ours. Uh, it's a point that's very easy to overlook. So working constructively with these constructive, uh, largely Islamic countries, to me has got a very, very important kickback strategically. But Malaysia's an outward-looking country, highly successful. Yes, it has its challenges economically. It move, it's a little bit squeezed between, by its success actually, between its very success in dealing with um, low-cost labor um, electronic manufacturing, and now it needs to move up market uh, to more sophisticated product right. lines. Well, he's a very good friend of mine, and he's an outstanding uh, minister for his country. And uh, they've got very able political leadership, in our view. Uh, so they, they, they're an open economy, and uh, um, the only exception in the FTA there was alcohol because of their Islamic culture, which we, we appreciate and respect. So, you know, what I'm saying is that you're seeing a, a flight to quality, contrary to what was said uh, 15 years ago about FTAs, and you're seeing a lot of the spaghetti in the bowl being wrapped up via contiguous FTAs now starting to merge, which is, of course, what TPP is meant to be about. So you've got these eight countries led by the United States. They've got their own networks. We're an exception to it, but most have got an FTA already with the United States. And therefore, if we go back to the original critique of FTAs and RTAs, you know, there's all the complexity of different rules of origin and different deals here and there. Well, we're trying to wrap them up into a common agreement. Now, this ain't easy, you know. This is, involves highly sensitive domestic issues, no more so than in the case of this great country. So we, but I've never seen a trade agreement that I describe it as easy, so, you know, nothing new in that. It's going to take us time uh, to work through, but the president is strongly committed to this. Uh, I know the president has said to uh, his ministers and his senior officials that he wants to see something by the end of the year. We're going to try and achieve that objective precisely um, uh, you know, how far we'll get is in the hands of the gods, but or the negotiating gods in this case. But uh, that's the objective, and we see this as um, first commercial, second strategic in terms of trade policy, thirdly strategic in terms of the political relationships amongst our countries, and we've just gone in depth into the issues around Malaysia as a potential strong candidate, not quite in the system, but we very comfortable with Malaysia joining, I know. Um, and thirdly, I mean, this is the U.S. Uh, ticket to continuing to be the leader of Asia-Pacific trade investment integration. Now, TPP is not the only game in town. There are other games in town. And I, I don't know how well this is understood, frankly, in some circles in the United States. I'm sure your leaders understand this. So you've got China laying down a card saying, we can play. I mean, that... It, is the significance of their FTA with New Zealand. Now, you can say, well, only New Zealand, small country, uh, yeah, 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 but big countries always start policy shifts with small countries. I referred to the shift in U.S. policy in 1982 when Bill Brock shifted U.S. policy. Who was the, who did they did their first deal with? Israel. People often miss the significance. I remember at the time of this shift in U.S. policy precisely because they said, oh, it's only Israel. I mean, it's just a political ally of the United States. I mean, of no consequence economically. Well, what a wrong judgment that proved to be. So China's laid down its card. It can do FTAs with clean, comprehensive deals. Um, we're waiting for our Aussie mates to dock into that. Um, we've got the a a a agreement in the center, geographic center of Asia between Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia. ASEAN has launched two initiatives, one called ASEAN Plus Three, which is they, the 10 ASEAN countries, plus the great East Asian economies of China, Japan, and Korea, and a complementary or competing initiative 
called ASEAN plus six, which is those 13 countries plus Australia, New Zealand, and most intriguingly, India. Note that the US is not part of this. But TPP is ahead of the game here. Those are study processes. They may or may not lead to plurilateral comprehensive trade and investment integration frameworks in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, with TPP, we're ahead of the game. We're, we've gone past that stage. We're actually now negotiating. And um, I mean, I think a lot of us being very close friends of the United States, uh, are of course, very comfortable with traditional U.S. leadership on these issues. Um, we want to see the U.S. be at front and center of this process. It does have strategic implications for the United States that go well beyond trade. We fully recognize that the grouping in, it as in, in its current configuration is not sufficiently large to be a game changer for the United States. That's fully understood. We're, you know, it may be small, but we're not stupid. <laughs> We're quite sophisticated people, and we get it. So the whole concept here is to try and use um, a, well, it's not that small, you know, but a relatively modest group of countries, Australia and New Zealand um, and the others, Singapore and co, and Peru, and move this game forward to establish a template for trade and investment integration and then with U.S. leadership within it, then move on to the economically more interesting agenda of the really big economies of Asia. I mean, that's the game plan. I don't think TPP makes sense to the United States except looking at it as a dynamic. Uh, the problem for the U.S. will be to maintain strategic unity of vision and keep that strategic concept uppermost in its mind as it proceeds, given the fact that we, I mean, uh, uh, everything in this country is open to public scrutiny. Uh, there's going to be all manner of lobbies that will want to tear this down uh, and won't be uh, the slightest bit interested in the bigger U.S. strategic interests. So that's about how I see it. Could you, uh, thank you. Could you, as a last question, um, since you think, obviously far beyond the, the trade remit. Could you talk about the, the three things Americans should know about uh, New Zealand or think about uh, New Zealand um, as they think about the trade agreement and, and our relationship going forward? Well, it may sound a very conventional thing to say, but I think shared values lies at the foundation stone of a relationship. And uh, just remember this. New Zealand in the last century has been only ever invaded once, and that was by Americans. About, I don't know how many thousands of GIs invaded our country in 1941-42 on R&R, &R, and there were many ugly scenes between young American males and New Zealand males competing for the same women. Um, I don't know whether we should say that on television. But shared values lies at the heart of that relationship. Um, and... Uh, I think increasingly n now this vision of us as a predominantly Anglo-Saxon country, though we have a very interesting mix now of Asian people and, of course, the traditional indigenous Polynesian people who make a fantastic contribution to New Zealand and increasingly savvy in business sense. Th we're looking to Asia. That's where the United States' long-term interest lies. And New Zealand is a fantastic albeit very small, partner of the United States together with the Australians in that region. So, I mean, I see it shared interests. Um, uh, you know, we all now follow the Joseph Nye concept of soft power. Uh, New Zealand doesn't have any hard power except, um, as Bob Hormatz once said to me, you're sort of the Saudi Arabia of milk, aren't you? You know, well, okay, okay, okay. Uh, but uh, putting aside Bob's joke, um, we only have soft power and ideas to sell, but uh, you don't need to be a big country to have a good idea. And um, I, I mean, one thing I've always liked about the American people is um, they're always ready to listen. So, I, I mean, those are the sort of general comments. I hope they don't sound too um, too goody two shoes, but uh, I, I think they have I think they have merit, and I think they have substance behind them. Mr. Minister, thank you very much for spending some time with us. That was a fantastic uh, 
uh, tour of uh, the trade 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 in New Zealand, your perspective uh, of trade developments in Asia, and the relationship with the United States. Thank you, and, and good luck on your trip here. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thanks.